Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy little human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy we can meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this craziness today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing a twisted, twisted man named Joel Guy Jr. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out new true crime videos every single week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. And you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you want. They're both Bratterstein, but no pressure. Okay, now that I am done begging you to join my cult, we can get into this video. And now this, this case, if you have not heard it, bro, let me tell you what. It is insane. It is almost unheard of in its, um brutality. And it's one that I've wanted to cover for a while. It's been on the list and I just hadn't gotten to it. And it's also one that was recommended by a couple of members of the Brat Pack here. So I want to thank Callie, Jennifer, and Brenda for their suggestion and the actual nightmares. Okay. So essentially what happened here is Joel Guy Jr. attempted to commit the perfect murder and for the most basic and lame of all reasons ever money. But due to the sheer brutality of the murders he committed, it does lend one to believe that there may be more to this murder motive than simply money. Because in the course of this man's murders, he made, and I'm quoting the prosecuting attorney here, a quote, diabolical stew of human remains. If that doesn't paint a picture, I don't know what does. So today I'm going to be telling you that whole story. And while I do, I'm going to be putting on a full face of makeup, hence the makeup and morbid makeup. Now, if that's not really your thing, that's cool. Thanks for hanging out this long. I hope you find a channel that presents this case in a way that you prefer. But if you're on the fence, you're not sure how you feel, maybe stick around. You might be surprised by how much you like me. And if any of you are ever curious about what makeup or anything I'm using, it'll all be listed down below for your convenience. Now, with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the twisted murders committed by Joel Guy Jr. To get started with our case today, we're first going to jump in our handy dandy time machine and we're going to head to late November of 2016 in Knoxville, Tennessee. This is where a couple, Joel Guy Sr. and his wife, Lisa Guy, were preparing to have Thanksgiving like most American families in late November. They were really excited to have the, their large close-knit family in one place. They were going to have all their children all their grandchildren in one place to share dinner together and just have a good time. If you've ever had Thanksgiving, you know, maybe, you know, I don't know your life for my house. It's a, it's a great time of, um, hanging out, seeing each other, eating until you cannot move and then taking naps in the living room or wherever you happen to fall. Unfortunately though, for the guy family, the good times would not continue to roll past the holiday season because by the end of that holiday weekend, both Joel Guy Sr. and Lisa Guy would be murdered and dismembered in their own home. At the time of their murders, Joel Guy Sr., who was 61 years old, had just retired from working as a pipeline engineering designer. He had worked in this um, field for many years, but had recently lost his job and had decided it was time for him to retire. And his wife, 55-year-old Lisa Guy, had worked as a human resources accounts payable administrator and was just on her, I believe, last week of work, and she was going to be retiring as well. Joel Guy Sr. had been married once before to a woman named Patricia, but the two didn't work out, and eventually he met his forever wife, Lisa. Joel had three daughters when him and Lisa met, twin girls named Angela and Michelle, and a third daughter named Shandice, and these three girls were all born to his first wife, and though they were technically Lisa's stepchildren, she didn't see them that way, and they didn't really see her as a stepmother either. Joel and Lisa had married when the girls were still pretty young, so Lisa had been there pretty much their entire life, so they just saw her as their other mama. The girls would come and visit every summer for an entire month, and they always looked forward to it because Lisa and Joel had a more stable household. Not that their biological mother wasn't a good mama, she just, you know, 
She was doing it all on her own, which brings with it many challenges. But Lisa and Joel were a two partner household. So the dynamic was just different. It was always a warm and happy home. Lisa was always making sure dinner was on the table for the family meals. And she would like greet Joel at the door all lovey-dovey, which is so cute to me because they had been married at this point for over three decades. And the girls also said that Lisa always had the cupboard stocked with sweets and treats for them when they were kids. And so Joel's daughters just loved that. One of Joel's daughters, Michelle, even said that like, she wanted to be like Lisa. She said she looked up to her so much that when she got her own engagement ring later as an adult, it was an exact replica of Lisa's engagement ring. She said she wanted to be the woman Lisa was, the mother Lisa was. She called her her best friend, which is just like, <sighs> hits you in the heart right there, you know? So Joel Guy Sr. had worked in his field for many, many years, but the year that his life would be tragically stolen from him, he was actually laid off from work. And he decided that instead of trying to find another job at his age, he was just gonna retire. He's like, I've done this plenty of time. It's time for me to just kind of stay home and spend more time with my wife. So he and Lisa actually sat down, they looked at their finances together and they realized that Lisa could afford to stop working as well and they could both retire at the same time and just stay home and spend their time together. But in doing this, that meant that Lisa would no longer be working. So the money that she was bringing in from her job, which went entirely towards her son, Joel Guy, Joel Guy Jr.'s expenses, would no longer be coming in, which meant that her son, Joel Guy Jr., would have to get a job and be on his own. And he just had not done that yet, even though he was in his late 20s. Regardless of this though, the couple had plans to retire. They were going to sell the family home that they lived in now, and they were going to move to the small town of Sir Goinesville. Uh, it was about an hour and a half away from their current home in Knoxville, Tennessee, and they were gonna move there and live in the house that Joel Sr.'s mother had previously owned when she was alive. They had it all worked out. Everything was planned and everything seemed like it was going well and they were really excited about their future together. And just like not working, can you imagine? Sounds tight. <laughs> so now we're gonna fast forward to Thanksgiving break of 2016. The week, you know, that wonderful four day weekend that a lot of us get where everything is just a giant blur and then you wait till Christmas and then it's over and then you're sad. So Thanksgiving weekend, Lisa and Joel are super, super stoked because they're going to be having all of Joel's daughters over and all of their grandkids and they're really excited. And then they get the surprise of their life when their son, Joel Guy Jr. actually decides that he's gonna show up as well. You see, this was a big surprise because he wasn't planning to come down and visit until the following month at Christmas break. So when he showed up, they were like, holy shit, we've got everyone here at one time. That's awesome. And what was even more surprising than Joel's um, unexpected arrival, which was already like, it wasn't not in his character, was his attitude because he was um, pleasant. And that was kind of unheard of for Joel Guy Jr. Typically, this baby steals my oxygen. And this was just like a happy surprise for his family. Or maybe it wasn't, I don't really know if they cared, but he was just like in a very good mood. Normally he would be in his room. He would like at family gatherings, instead of hanging out in the family room, playing games, talking, drinking, doing all the fun stuff, he would just like eat and then seclude himself in the room, whatever room he was staying in at the time. He was very distant and aloof. He didn't really care about engaging with the family, but this time he was present, he was, attentive, he was friendly, he was talking to his parents, he was talking to his sisters, he was playing with his nephews, and the boy's mom were, uh, were surprised because she didn't even know that he knew his nephew's names, like he was that disconnected. But this time, not only was he playing with them, but he like went into his room and got a bunch of toys out for them to give them as gifts. And they were like, who is this man, this imposter, who's pretending to be Joe Kai Jr.? Joel Guy Jr., the man who generally didn't act like his nephews even existed, was now in his room passing out Beanie Babies. Though the weekend had been pretty good, there was at one point a notable shift in the energy. There seemed to be some tension between Joel Guy Jr. and his parents, and his sister noticed it. So at some point during the evening, she like took her dad aside and was like, hey, what's up, what's going on? It's clear that you guys are kind of at odds right now and everything was so cool. So what happened? And this is when Joel Guy Sr. informed his daughter that the conversation had come up of Joel Jr. no longer being able to be financially supported by his parents. They let him know like, hey, we're 
leaving, we're retiring, we're not going to be able to take care of you. And the conversation didn't really go well, as I'm sure anyone could imagine it, it wouldn't. Um, and because of that, there was a little bit of tension between them. That night, Joel Jr.'s sisters left saying goodbye to their parents, having no idea this would be the last time they would ever see them alive again. The following day, Joel Guy Jr. and Joel Guy Sr. loaded up the family boot, because they had one of those, and they were going to be transporting it from their current home in Knoxville, Tennessee, to their new home in Sircoinsville, which was, again, about an hour and a half away. Um, so they loaded up the boat, they drove there, they, they drove back, and this is the last time that anyone reported seeing Joel Guy Sr. and Lisa Guy alive, and it was that morning when they were, like, in the driveway loading up the boat for transport. Now, did something happen on this car ride, this long car ride from Knoxville to Sirgoinsville and back that kind of triggered the events of what happened next? We really don't know. Um, but it was clear to investigators after looking into this case that this definitely wasn't like a spur of the moment act of rage killing that just happened over strictly something that happened over that weekend. Because when they looked into it, they found that Joel Guy Jr. had planned this murder out um, extensively and for a good period of time before actually committing the murders. So it was very, 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 very premeditated on his part. So Joel Guy Sr. and his wife, Lisa Guy, had fallen off the map this weekend. And it was definitely noticed by the couple's daughters because they usually talked to their dad and to Lisa like every single day. They even had a group chat where they would often speak several times a day and there had just been radio silence ever since they had left from the thanksgiving holiday and one of the girls birthdays had even come and gone and they didn't receive any information any information any correspondence with their father or lisa and this was very odd this was so out of character for the guys that it definitely ra raised some alarm bells for their daughters so their daughter Michelle decided since she lived the closest that she would drive over and just kind of check in and see what's up because it just wasn't like them to go with such radio silence since none of them had talked to them since the holiday. So the day Michelle decided she was going to go over and see what was going on was Monday, November 28th and she was going to head over after she finished work for that day. But unfortunately she never got the chance to do so because midday police were already at that house discovering the two's bodies. So let's now talk about that day, November 28th, 2016, when Joel Guy Sr. and Lisa Guy were found dead in their home. That day, Lisa Guy was scheduled to show up at work. It was her last week of work before retirement, and she never showed up at her, her scheduled time. And this was just completely unlike Lisa. So it immediately raised some red, red alarm bells red flags, alarm bells, in her, her co-workers' brains. Li their lizard brains were tingling. So her co-worker and supervisor and friend named Jennifer actually called police and requested a welfare check. This may sound dramatic, but she had called both the couple's cell phones and their landlines over and over, received no response. And Lisa had worked at this company for a couple years. She was dependable. She was reliable. They they knew her work ethic and her character, and this was so out of character for her. And yes, she had technically quit this job. She had put in her, uh, her, her notice that she was quitting just a couple of days before. And some people are the type that will put in their notice. And then like each day after putting in their notice, their alarm clock will go off and they'll be like, why am I even finishing this off? Like, fuck this. I'm just going to stay home. But that wasn't Lisa. That wasn't in her nature. That wasn't in her character. They knew her pretty well. You know, you become friends with coworkers a lot of the time. And that just wasn't like her. And in addition to that, her and her coworkers had plans together that day. They were going to be going out to lunch to say kind of like one last hurrah, to say goodbye to her before she retired. And this is just not something she would have missed. And if she wasn't going to be able to make it, she would have definitely called. So it wasn't a normal day at work. It was like Lisa day. And Lisa was like, no, fuck this. Like, that doesn't make any sense. So she called the cops for a welfare check. A detective who worked this case named Jeremy McCord later said of this fact, and I quote, it's odd for me when someone has a planned event and they don't show up for it, especially a hallmark event, like you're retiring. That would cause any reasonable person alarm. 
An officer was dispatched to go to the home do, to do the welfare check because of Jennifer's phone call. And one cop uh, ended up showing up alone the first time and he got there. He noticed there were some cars in the driveway. He like walked to the door. He knocked on the door. Nobody answered. Guess no one's home. He, like walked around the side of the house, kind of listened at the windows, looked in the backyard and didn't see anything. And so he decided like, if I don't see anything, I don't hear anything. I guess there is nothing going on. So he just dipped. So meanwhile, Jennifer is waiting by the phone to hear from police, to hear what happened when they went to do the welfare check, or alternatively, for Lisa to just like stumble through the door with some excuse as to why she was late, though it was looking more and more like that wasn't gonna be happening. But as the minutes passed and neither of these things happened, Jennifer got more and more worried. So she decided like, fuck this and called police back herself. And when they answered, she was like, sup? bro, what's going on with my friend? I still haven't heard anything. She still hasn't shown up. And this is when officers tell Jennifer that like, oh no, no, we did send an officer over. They went, they checked the house and nothing seemed wrong. There was nobody there. Everything was just like totally normal. Um, nothing to worry about here. And so when Jennifer was like, listen, maybe this is the point where we're gonna have to like agree to disagree, but I actually know her. And it's very unlike her to, to not show up. This has to be something wrong. Maybe you could send somebody back and they could try just like a little bit harder because I know my friend and there's no way that she wouldn't show up unless there was a reason. So if you could maybe take your job a little more seriously, that would be point. I'm paraphrasing. I don't know if she said it like that. She probably didn't, but you get the gist. Police surprisingly actually listen to Jennifer and more officers are dispatched to the guy home. I believe it was either two or three this time. I know the first time it was one Second time it was either two or three. So they get there and it's, they notice the same things that the original officer noticed, that there are cars in the driveway, they go to the front door and nobody's answering the door. But this time one of the officers actually looks through the door because they had one of those doors, it's like a door with a piece of glass in the center, one of those fancy doors where you can look through and see inside. And when the officer looked inside, he noticed that there was a bunch of groceries on the floor that were just sitting there and it looked like there were some perishables up in that bitch and that stuff like needed to go in the fridge but it wasn't in there so that was already a little bit odd they also noticed that the front door seemed odd it seemed out of place it didn't look like it belonged on that door and it had marks on it so it looked like it had been recently installed noting that this was odd police decide they want to search a little further so they go over to that side gate where the initial officer had went but this time these cops jumped the gate and went in the backyard and they noticed that there was an empty dog house and then a patio that led to the back door and when they walked up to the back door this is where things got a little bit odd because they noticed that the doorknob from the back door was just missing there's just a hole where um, the doorknob should be and it was later found out that the doorknob on the back door was missing because it had been removed to be placed on the front door you know how the officer noted that the doorknob on the front door seemed out of place. Well, somebody, Jill Guy Jr., had taken the doorknob off the back door and put it on the front door. We'll get into why a little bit later. And so there was just a hole where a doorknob should be. And when the officer like crouched down to look through this hole to get a better look inside, he was smacked in the face with a strong chemical smell and with a bunch of heat that was protruding or escaping from the hole in the door. Naturally, police were like, what the fuck? But they didn't have a way into the home and for whatever reason, they didn't want to just break in at this point, though I do feel like that's kind of probable cause, but either way, they didn't want to do that. So they're like, how are we gonna get in this house? But remember how I told you that the guys were in the process of selling their home? Because of this, there was a Century 21 sign on their front lawn. And the officers were like, sometimes real estate agents have keys or sometimes there are keys on the property so that real estate agents can get in. So they contact the real estate agent to see if they know of a way to gain access to the property. So when they called this real estate agent, they learned that the guys had actually already sold their home and they were set to be out. Like they had like a date that they had to be out by that was coming up. And so the cops were like, okay, cool. Um, is there a way for us to get into this property? And the real estate agent lets them know that, yeah, there should be like a lockbox on the doorknob. You put in a code or a key and you get the key to the front door. You unlock it and you go in. But um, seeing as how the front doorknob had been removed and replaced, this lockbox was no longer there. So she's like, huh, that's weird. Okay, are, the, are there cars there? If their cars are there, you could go, you could look in the car for like a garage door opener or a, or a house key, something like that. You know, pull down the visors, look in the car and see if you can find something. 
So officers did check the car and they didn't find any house keys, but they did find the garage door clicker. They clicked it, they entered the home through the garage. And as soon as they entered the garage, they found that the smell of chemicals and the heat were way, way more intense, but not e nearly as intense as it was about to be. Because once they opened the door that led from the garage into the house, they were knocked on their asses by the smell and the heat. And it was so bad that one of the officers noted that the skin on his face tingled and burned. As officers entered the home, they found a lot of weird stuff. They found the wallets and identification of both Joel Guy Sr. and Lisa Guy. They found several open bottles of cleaner and chemicals like bleach and shit all over the place. They found a hammer. I believe they found a sledgehammer as well, if I remember correctly. They found a shit ton of guns, just guns and ammo all over the dining room table. They found a new doorknob, like a lock set on the kitchen table that was yet to be installed. They saw all the groceries all over um, in front of the front door, including several cases of beer. And as they continued further, they found what was causing the immense heat. And it's first because they got, they checked like th the thermostat and it was set to 90 degrees. Somebody intentionally roasted that house. And then on top of that, um, plugged into the wall, Jesus, baby brain plugged into the wall. There was a portable heater and a hair dryer just plugged in ready for heating. As the officers made their way upstairs, they found even more intense stuff. First, on the carpet of the stairs and on the wall leading up to the stairs, there was lots of dark stains that looked to be blood. And when they were tested, it was definitely blood. And as they got to the top of the stairs, they found that there was a baby gate separating the first and the second floor from each other. And in the distance, they heard the awful sounds of a dog just like crying and crying. So I'm assuming the baby gate was there to stop the dog from going up and down, you know, keeping them in one place. I use, it doesn't, it's not effective, but I've tried that with my dog before. And yeah, it's not effective because he's big and he'd just be like, okay, so I'm gonna walk over this because fuck you, I'm a big ass dog. <laughs> Once they entered um, the second floor through the baby gate, right on the other side of the baby gate, they found a pile of bloody women's clothes that had like a cut through them, like they had been cut off somebody um, in a pile, like a dark, dark pool. Um, and next to that was a couple of buckets of more chemicals. It's hard to say what exactly there were because there were just various different types of cleaners and chemicals all over this house as police were searching. And I can only imagine at this point that as police continue to search this house, their anxiety raises more and more as they find no people, but just more and more craziness at every turn. As they searched room by room, they found rolls of plastic, more cleaner, knives, gloves, and all of this with that awful, deafening sound of a baby puppy just howling in the background. I can't even imagine what that was like. And they kept searching, kept, you know, clearing the house room by room until they came across the workout room. It was like an at-home gym. And as they looked in there, they saw a pair of hands, severed male hands lying on the floor in what they described as the, as the prayer position. And as soon as they saw that, they were like, oh, fuck this, we got to get out of here and call for backup because they probably weren't like homicide crime scene techs, you know what I mean? So they headed out, which I would have done the same if I found a pair of severed hands in a workout room. Detective Jeremy McCord said of this moment, and I quote, walking through the downstairs of the house, nothing made sense to me. You can see straight down the hall and I saw hands not connected to a body. At that point, the other officers held the hallway and we started doing standard building clearing. I will never get those smells out of my head or my dreams. 61-year-old Joel Guy Jr. had been stabbed to death. He had been stabbed at least 44 times. And we say at least 44 times because at the time the bodies were found, they were so badly decomposed that this is just what they could deduce based on what they could see in the soft tissue that was still remaining after decomposing the way he had. And this attack had happened in the workout room of his home. He had been stabbed in several of his internal organs and some of his ribs had even been like broken off due to the stabs. He was then dismembered, his hands being removed, his arms being removed, his legs being removed and a single foot being removed. 
When he was discovered, his skull had been skeletonized from being soaked in a liquid inside of a tote, and there was damage to the front of the skull, but it's hard to say if it was blunt force trauma or caused by the liquid he had been soaking in as well. 55-year-old Lisa Guy had been stabbed to death as well. She had been stabbed at least 25 times, most of her stabs coming to her back. And like her husband, she had many of her ribs broken due to the force of the stabs, and many of her organs had been punctured. Lisa also had at least five superficial stabs to her buttocks. And also, like her husband, she had been dismembered. Her legs had been cut off, her arms had been cut off, and her head had been removed and broke. Her head was later found. Remember when I said when they walked through the kitchen, there was a pot boiling on the stove? Her head had been placed in that pot and was boiling on the stove. I got, I got nothing, I got nothing to add there. Most of the dismembered body parts had been placed in blue totes. There was one tote for Lisa, one tote for Joel Sr. And they had been covered with water and sewer line cleaner. And it was thought that this was to aid in a speedier decomposition. So this is why there was, you know, damage to the uh, soft tissue and to the bone that they couldn't determine if it was from the attack or if it was from soaking in that liquid. One of the officers who was present that day said of this discovery, and I quote, It's something that'll stay with you for the rest of your life. You'll never forget it. Upon further investigation of the home, once they had, you know, called for backup, found the bodies and everything, and thoroughly searched the upstairs area, they found a lot of evidence that proved to be very, very useful in their prosecution of the murderer. They found sheets of rolled up plastic, another plugged in heater in the bathroom. The floors were covered in plastic and inside there, that's where they found the two large totes that held the discarded body parts of both Joel Sr. and Lisa. In the bathroom, there was also another heater, some gloves and a knife. Inside the workout room of the house, where Joel Sr. was killed, the floors and walls were covered in blood, along with a pull-out couch that was in the room, which in addition to being covered in blood, had stab marks in it. Some of the workout equipment had been overturned and disheveled, and there were a couple of knives on the floor next to a bloody pile of clothes. The bathroom upstairs was also covered in blood. There were bloody clothes on the floor and a knife on the counter. In another room, Joel Jr.'s room, the one that he was staying in when he was visiting, there's a partially packed suitcase, a laptop with an external hard drive, and a red backpack. Inside the backpack, there was a notebook, and inside this notebook, officers were going to find everything they needed to properly prosecute this case. Well, not everything. A multitude of things that would help prosecute this case. But we're going to get into what was in that notebook in just a little while later. So, you remember in the beginning of this video when I told you that Joel Sr.'s daughter, Lisa's stepdaughter, Michelle, was going to drive over to the house to find out what happened to her parents, but never got a chance to. Well, she never got a chance to because, you know, the cops found the bodies, and they actually did reach out to her directly. Now, I don't know why they reached out to her specifically. I don't know if she was listed as next of kin. I don't know if they got her contact from their cell phones or what, or if it's just that she was the daughter who lived the closest to the crime scene, so she would be the best to contact, but they did. They contacted her and they let her know that some bodies had been found in her parents' home and that they were unidentified at this point. And they wanted to know from her if there was anyone else who had been staying at the house with her parents who they might want to contact, who could be one of the victims who could be involved. And that's when she said, yes my brother, Joel Jr. Now, who was Joel Guy Jr.? Joel Guy Jr. was born on March 13th, 1988, and Joel was described as being reclusive and socially awkward throughout his life, spending much of his time alone, isolating himself in his room to just play on his computer for hours on end. But where he lacked social skills, he made up for in academics. He graduated from the Louisiana School for Math, Science, and Arts in 2006. 
He had also spent a semester at the George Washington University, but had dropped out and spent most of his life living with his parents in Tennessee. He later went on to Louisiana State University to study plastic surgery because that's what he wanted to do for a living. And at that time, he was living in a Baton Rouge apartment while his family had moved back to their home in Tennessee. He had spent nine years in college without graduating, and all of it was financed by his parents. By the time of the murders, Joel Guy Jr. was 28 years old and had never really held down a steady job. He had never had to actually work. Joel was a bit of a spoiled kid. I mean, when he was in whoop, makeup in the hair, when he was in high school, he went to like a private high school. He had never had to work and was almost 30 years old. And he just was like kind of a dick to his parents. You know, he was reclusive and not loving and not attentive and not like appreciative of the things his parents did for him, which is just messed up but I guess that sometimes happens when like you're a spoiled little shithead kid even though some kids can have a lot and still like appreciate the things that they have and still appreciate their parents for doing doing what they can to give them what they need but not not this guy not this guy at all and now they were planning to they were selling their home they were going to move away they were going to cut him off and this wasn't you know something that was ideal for a spoiled little shithead brat who was, you know, a bit of a loner, had no friends, had nothing else going on. And now he didn't even have this and was going to be expected to work. No, it was very Jill Roberts and Scream 4. Like, what am I supposed to do? Get a job? Work? Like, yeah, bitch. That's what we all have to do. Guess what? That's what you have to do too. You're not born a Kardashian. You don't just have like money at your disposal to help you, um, well, I'm not saying that they don't work, but you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Like he was just a spoiled little brat who thought his parents were like a lot more wealthy than they were and assumed because of that, he could fucking have an easy ride through his life. And when he found out he wasn't going to get that, he was like, I'm going to throw a temper tantrum and kill everybody. And it's like, just chill out, drink a seven up, eat a moon pie, stop killing people. At the time of the murders, Joel Jr. did not live at home anymore. He was living about nine and a half hours away, depending on what route you take, in an apartment in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, while his parents were living in Tennessee. And his parents paid for everything. They paid for his apartment. They paid for his tuition. They bought him a car. They paid for the gas that went in his car. They paid for everything. <laughs> I'm harping on this, but it makes me insane. It's just that, like, he was 28 years old. And he had never had to work at all, had everything paid for. And his mom, this is what's going to make you fucking crazy. Lisa was only working to pay for Joel's expensive expenses. She didn't have to work. She was literally only doing it so that she could support him. And he was such an ungrateful little, little rube. And it makes me insane. And, you know, she was now going to retire. And they told him, like, sorry, bud. Uh, mom's not going to be working anymore to support you. We're going to retire. Like, sucks to suck. It's time to, to put on your work boots and go out and get yourself a job and learn how to be a self-sufficient adult at the young, ripe age of 28. So once police realized that it was Joel Jr. who they were looking for, they started sort of putting the pieces together and making a case um, against Joel Jr. And they started by first piecing together his timeline prior to the murders because he made this incredibly easy to do because he had left a bunch of receipts for different items he had bought to use in the commission of the murder at the murder scene. In the weeks prior to the murders, Joel Guy Jr. had been buying various items that definitely looked weird in the context they were being looked at now. They saw on surveillance that he had gone to an Ace Hardware store in Lowe's and he had purchased chemicals that were found scattered around the house, a pipe wrench, which he used to remove the shower head in the bathroom and install a hose, which he hoped to use to clean the crime scene and conceal evidence. He had purchased uh, Clorox wipes. He had also made more purchases, this time from a Home Depot. He bought extension cords, a bleach sprayer, and a timer. The next day he was caught on camera buying a knife and a couple days later he was caught on camera buying the blue bins that were later found holding his bo his parents' body parts and all of these other items were discovered at the crime scene. And as if that's not already like 
a lot of evidence. This guy was just so dumb to me, man. He also thought it was a wise decision, a decision that would not cause people to look at him. It wasn't suspicious at all for him to prepay a bunch of his bills after killing his parents. Why did he think that this would be like a smart thing to do? Why did he think that this wouldn't be weird and draw attention to him? I just don't understand. He prepaid his rent at his apartment for a couple of months in advance, totaling $10,000. And he paid for his tuition at school for, for more time at school, even though he had been there um, almost a decade trying to be a plastic surgeon and not uh, receiving a degree. For somebody who's supposed to be smart, <laughs> You are so dumb. You are really, really dumb. <laughs> so police watched Joel Guy Jr. for a couple of hours, um, just kind of trying to see what he would do, kind of watch him, see his routine, but not very long because just a day after the bodies were found on November 29th, when he went to leave and get into his car, police arrested Joel Guy Jr. And it's believed that he was going to be heading back to his parents' home in Tennessee to like finish the job at the time because when he was arrested in his trunk, they found a gas can and a meat grinder. Officer McCord said of the arrest, quote, he knew why we were there. He knew he was coming. When police searched Joel's apartment, Joel Jr.'s apartment in Baton Rouge, they found that he was probably trying to figure out how best to proceed with disposing of his parents because they found a dog bone in a blue tub filled with chemicals. And it's thought that he was kind of trying to see how long it would take the bone to disintegrate. So Joel Guy Jr. was arrested. And once he was and a trial ensued, all of the evidence was laid out and it painted a very clear, but very gruesome picture of what Joel Guy Jr. intended to do, what he actually accomplished and why. Now, let's start with that notebook I was telling you guys about. Remember I told you about that notebook that was found at the crime scene? Let's start with uh, talking about what was discovered in that little thing. Inside this notebook, someone, <laughs> Joel Guy Jr., had written down their entire murder plan from start to finish, writing things like, I'm going to give you some little quotes here. Get killing knives. Get sledgehammer to crush bones. Bring blender and food grinder to grind meat. Get rid of bodies and DNA. Flush chunks down toilet. Flood house and turn on heaters. And then a bunch of various other things that showed that he was going to, you know, murder them and then try to conceal all of the evidence that anything had even happened in that house in various different, uh, different ways. And then he was going to destroy the house either by flooding it or burning it. And then he was going to try to frame his father for the entire thing. He had also put into motion the plan to have an automated text sent from his mother's phone to his phone when he was already back in Baton Rouge to show that they were still alive once he was gone to take suspicion off of him for the murders. The notebook also included motive, money and property. All of Joel Jr.'s parents' finances and assets would go to him. He knew he'd get at least $500,000 from his mother's life insurance policy and that if his father was dead or missing, the entire amount would go to him. And the timing of these murders was not a coincidence either because Lisa's retirement, like the, um, the life insurance was coming through her job. So once she quit, she wouldn't have that life insurance anymore. So seeing as she had just a week left of work, this was the time he had to kill her if he wanted to get that money. Basically Joel Jr.'s plan was set to begin the day of the murders when his mother left the house to go shopping for the day. Joel planned to either break the garbage disposal or make it seem like the garbage disposal wasn't working and then call his father down to fix it. And while his father was on the ground, incapacitated and unaware, trying to fix the garbage disposal, Joel Jr. was going to stab him to death and make sure that the deed was done by the time his mother returned home from the store. And once she returned home, he was going to stab her to death as well. But things didn't really go 
as Joel had planned. I mean, for starters, his father was murdered in the weight room. And on top of that, um, his dad fought back and fought back hard. When Joel Jr. was arrested, he was covered in bruises and scratches, and he had cuts on his hands because it appeared that at some point, Joel Sr. had gotten a hold of a knife and had been slashing at him as well. Joel Sr. also had defensive wounds on his hands from trying to fight off his own son from murdering him. But he wasn't successful. He was overpowered and he was killed. And um, once Joel Jr. had killed his father, he cut his clothes off his body and those were the clothes that were found in the weight room. Joel Jr. then waited for his mother to come home. And she did, she got home and she started carrying in her groceries. She was carrying them in in trips because she bought so much stuff and like leaving them in on the floor going back and forth. So some of the groceries were on the floor inside the house and some were still in her car. This woman did not even finish unloading her groceries out of her car before her own son murdered her. And once he was done killing her, he cut the clothes off her body as well. And that's what was found at the top of the stairs just past the baby gate. Joel Jr. seemed to have a lot of hate for his mother Though she was stabbed less times than her father, he did decapitate her and put her head in that pot. And he didn't just cut her head off. He snapped her head off at the vertebrae on the back of her neck by force. And that, that takes a, a lot of brutality and a lot of anger to do. Detective Jeremy McCord described what he found in that house day as, quote, the most horrific thing I've ever encountered in police work in my life. After death, both bodies were dismembered, as I said, and both bodies were given a large gash into like the torso area to allow the chemicals to seep into the body to make decomposition go by faster. The prosecutor on the case said of this crime scene, and I quote, the killer put Lisa's body parts in one, and Joel Sr.'s in another, and then covered them with a corrosive substance and left them there to liquefy into some sort of diabolical stew of human remains. Then the killer took Lisa's head and carried it downstairs and took it into the kitchen. He got out a stock pot, placed her head in the pot, filled it with liquid, carried it to the stove, covered it, turned off the stove, and left it there to cook. This was a monstrous crime. It also came out at trial that Joel Jr. was planning to use his father's severed hands to place fingerprints along the house to further push the narrative that his father had killed his mother and had maybe killed himself. Can you just imagine that for a second, walking around your parents' house with your father's severed hands, leaving fingerprints to frame him for a murder that you committed? In order to further push the narrative that Joel, uh, Joel Sr. was the one who was guilty of this crime, Joel Jr. had left a note at the crime scene that had been written by Joel Sr. previously. And in the context of the crime scene, it would definitely raise some eyebrows and make you suspect him. This note said, quote, Hold my dead ashes and sprinkle us both after you pass at Buzzard's Roost. Tell all my children I love them, and as you should know, I love you truly. I have had a blast. Now, why did Joel Sr. ever write this note? We'll never know, because he's not here to tell us. It is a little bit weird, but it didn't have anything to do with this crime, because it was dated 2013. <laughs> there was a date on the note, so unless Joel Jr. planned to, like, really doctor this up and just didn't get a chance to do so, I don't see how it would really be effective in the frame job, but uh, he didn't change the date. And it seems like Joel Jr. just kind of gave up halfway through his plan. Now, why Joel Jr. didn't continue with his plan, I, I really don't know. There could be a ton of reasons why he didn't finish. Maybe once he began, he realized that killing and dismembering two people was a lot more labor intensive than he had anticipated. Maybe halfway through, he like looked around the crime scene and realized he was like way in over his head on trying to like hide everything he had done because of how messy of a crime scene it was. Or maybe he was just taking a break, going home, trying to like rethink what he was doing and think of a better way to get it done. But either way, he just kind of gave up halfway through and then ended up getting caught. After the murders were committed, 
Joel Jr. headed to Walmart, the same store his mom had been shopping at earlier that day to purchase items to um, tend to the cut marks all over his hands, the wounds he had sustained when he was murdering his father. And after that, he just went back to his home in Baton Rouge, and while there, he received medical attention. Um, and it's thought that he went back to Louisiana to, to have his wounds looked at because it would look less suspicious than getting your wounds checked on the same night that your parents were murdered in that town. Joel's attorneys did, um, I mean, the best they could to try to prove that he wasn't guilty of these crimes. They didn't have a lot to work with, but they did the best they could. They tried to state that Joel Jr. couldn't have done it because of the sheer brutality of the crimes, that this took extreme anger and extreme rage, and that just wasn't inside Joel Jr., that he was a happy and content guy, that he had just been with his whole family on Thanksgiving, and he was happy, he was polite, he was playing with his nephews, he was smiling, he was engaging, he was taking family photos. Despite the fact that just him being pleasant, just him smiling, just him engaging, just him taking this family photo, standing next to his mother and looking pleasant, wasn't itself weird enough to draw suspicion. Um, they were just like, he didn't do it. Happy people just don't murder their parents. They just don't. Joel Jr.'s attorney just tried to hammer it in over and over that it wasn't Joel. He repeated like a thousand times that Joel Jr. was outgoing, friendly, and happy. Like he said this so many times during the trial. You can find the whole trial online, by the way. And he also tried to um, say that there was no way to prove that the notebook, including all of the murder information was Joel's, even though it was in his notebook with all his things in his handwriting. He also tried to say that there was no way to prove that it was Joel Jr. who was buying all of those murder items through the month of November because the person who had bought them had paid all in cash and had gone to different stores. Okay, except that they still have cameras at self-checkout lanes and Joel was seen on camera buying all those things. And even if that hadn't been good enough, all the items were found at the crime scenes. At the crime scenes, at the crime scene. There's only one of them. And um, his fingerprints and DNA were on them. So, I mean, good try. You gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do. That is your job. But it's like, it was just kind of dumb. But so is Joel Jr. So I don't know what to say about that. After three hours of deliberation, Joel Guy Jr. was found guilty on two counts of premeditated first-degree murder, three counts of felony murder, and two counts of abuse of a corpse. His two life sentences were given to him to serve consecutively, which means that even if he gets paroled after his first sentence, which he cannot get paroled for at least 51 years from, he will immediately have to start his next life sentence. At some point, Joel even tried to, like, fire his attorneys... And he filed a motion on, as his own, like representing himself, which is always a good idea um, in true crime cases. We always see that go very well for the murderers. And basically he wanted to file a motion that said that if he was found guilty, he would be given the death penalty. And obviously his, his defense team didn't want to do this because like their job is to not get him killed. And the prosecution wasn't even asking for the death penalty. So his motion ended up getting denied. They were like, no. We're not going to kill you, sorry, if that's what you want. Uh, and he ended up reinstating his attorney. And some people thought that he was doing this to, like, show that he was remorseful and that he wanted to die. But I think he just didn't want to live in prison. <laughs> and that he knew that um, killers on death row tend to have it better. And it takes forever to be executed anyway. And he was trying to get a better ride. But that's just my, uh, my take on it. Now, I want to read to you guys some of the victim impact statements that were read aloud at Joel Jr.'s hearing. And I just think it's important to see what a great loss these people were, you know, what losing them did. And it helps us remember that this kind of stuff has a ripple effect. It doesn't only affect the victims or the killer. It also makes victims out of everyone who loved these people. And I know that's such an obvious thing but I still think it's important to discuss because I feel like especially with true crime, and I know that this is true because I see it, we know these are people. We know these are people who lived. We know these are people who died. And we know there were people who cared about them. But I think sometimes it can fall so into um, this just becoming entertainment that you desensitize a little bit and forget that these people are gone forever. 
and or, or not that you forget but you don't let it sink in deep that these people are gone and that they were lost and that they meant so much to somebody you know and i also want you to keep in mind while you hear these heartfelt tear-filled statements statements that'll probably hit you in the heart and make you feel all types of fucked up and you didn't even know these people i want you to keep in mind that while these statements were read joel jr the son of these people the person who murdered them sat by emotionless as he listened to these people talk only even um moving or speaking when he asked his attorney for a little bit of water he just sat silently and coldly and listened to all of these people give their statements first lisa guy's brother alvin said to joel jr and i quote my sister lisa guy was truly one of the most loving caring and forgiving people on the face of the earth her husband my brother-in-law joel guy senior was honestly one of the most down-to-earth hard-working and kind people i ever met they were the type of people who would help out anyone anytime they could he continued by telling the court that his mother, Lisa's mother, Joel Jr.'s grandmother, had collapsed when she heard that her daughter had been murdered by her grandson and that she later died in the hospital after this and that he believed she had died of a broken heart. Next, a quote from Joel Guy Sr.'s daughter, I believe this was Shandice, and she said, and I quote, Dad and Lisa were wonderful. They were larger than life. They were so happy, such really good people, and they loved him. They loved him so much. They loved all of us. She then continued through tears, quote, for him to do what he did, I don't understand it. He has taken something from myself, from my children, dad and Lisa's grandchildren, my husband, and everyone in my family. He has taken from us what we will never get back. We'll continue now with a quote from Joel Sr.'s daughter, Angela, and she said all of this, like, through a broken voice, trying to keep her tears contained. For years, I felt like I have pushed it down, like it's not really happening, but it's real, and they are gone. And my dad was my best friend, and I will never get to hear his laugh again, or his incredible hugs. She described her father as a great storyteller, and she said that she loved to go fishing with him, and she just loved him so much, and she feels like she was robbed of never getting her dad to walk her down the aisle. She ended her statement with, quote, I still have my dad on speed dial, and it hurts for me to never get to speak to him again. And last, her twin sister, Michelle, had a pretty powerful statement. <laughs> she was pretty angry, it sounds like, which is absolutely reasonable. And she said, and I quote, I'm angry at my dreams being destroyed but I'm not the only one that has been affected. This has impacted my kids, and for that, I will never be able to forgive. I can rest easy knowing that God is okay with my choice to forgive someone that has murdered my parents. I have had to spend the last four years trying to save my children's souls, their spirits, and their hearts. I have spent the last four years cleaning up a mess. No one will ever know what it's like to be a child having to hear your grandmother's head was cooking in a pot. On a super selfish note, you will never know what it's like to tell your children that their grandparents were chopped up and put in acid. And with that powerful and gut-wrenchingly disturbing quote, that, my friends, is the story of the murder of Joel Guy Sr. and Lisa Guy at the hands of their only son, Joel Guy Jr. Isn't that just so intense and insane? And doesn't it seem almost not real? I cannot even imagine being one of the cops who walked into that house of horrors on that day to walk in and see that scene and to somehow like recover afterwards and just have to go about your day and continue your job. Like that's a normal day at work. That's fucking crazy. Um, body parts in a tote, a head in a pot on the stove and severed hands in the wick in, in the workout room what that's fucking crazy <laughs> it's just so upsetting dude because these people seemed like truly wonderful caring people who would do anything for their child and they really seemed to love him like why else would they have put up with him being the way he was and still paying his way like they clearly cared about him and they clearly loved him and he just didn't care and he was a selfish little shit and money really brings out the worst in people but with that said i feel like there had to be more to it than just the money because 
If it was just for money, why the dramatics? Why the brutality and the overkill and the cutting of the bodies and the snapping off the head? Like it's, it's so much that you don't need to do that I feel like there had to have been some serious hate behind those murders as well. There just, there had to be. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope you found it interesting and informative and it gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case because it is definitely a case worth remembering. And of course, I want you to thank you for remembering Joel Sr. and Lisa, Lisa Guy with me today, man. I truly cannot imagine what these people went through, what their final moments were like. It must have been so horrible, 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 and terrifying, horrible and terrifying, horrible, um, in those final moments. And they must have been so confused because they, because they loved their son, dude. They had photos of him all over their house. They paid for everything for him. They even named him after Joel Sr. And to have the one person in the world that you love so much as a parent and to give up all your life for and to do everything for just to kill you in such a brutal way and then disrespect your body after the fact in such an intense way is unimaginable. Uh, but anyways, guys, please let me know of any other cases you would like to see me cover down below. Um, as this case indicates, if you leave a suggestion, I will try to get to it. And if I do cover your case, I will give you a shout out. I love looking into the cases that you guys are suggest suggesting because you guys have a lot of really good suggestions um, for cases that I either have heard of and want to talk about more that I haven't heard of. Um, and I love to, to see the stuff you're into because I know you're filled with good taste and good ideas. Otherwise, you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new true crime video every single week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, I have all my social media linked down below. I have an Instagram, I have a Twitter, I have a Facebook page, and a Facebook group. And I also list down below all the makeup I'm using, the nail polish, the earrings, in case you like any of it and you want any of it. It's all listed down there for you, along with the compact. A lot of you ask about this compact. It's listed down there for you every week. You just got to look for it, because I know it's dope as fuck. Um, and I also put down there the link to my merch store in case you want to get something because I've made um, some designs because you wanted some merch. So I made you some merch. It's all down there for your convenience. Now with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. The very least, let's be better than Joel Guy Jr. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.